And Professor Gaurav Singh has earned his PhD from the Imperial College London. And he is also an engineer from Wixpilla. Uh, and uh, his specific interest is in mechanics, applied mechanics, to be specific, fracture mechanics. And his, his uh, research area revolves around theories, simulations, experiments in fracture mechanics. So more from him you are going to listen to today. Hopefully this is going to turn out as a wonderful session, something of your interest. And hopefully you take away something new from today's session. Thank you so much. And now I'm going to over to Professor Morev. Um, now it's on yours. Thank you. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, uh, sir. My name is uh, Gaurav. Uh, I'm a faculty, as I've been introduced to the Department of Applied Mechanics. Uh, now, one thing which I do, there's a camera here, but I ignore the camera, which is since I will only be talking to you. Okay, so that is what I'll be doing. Because it changes the technique. It's like you have to take many takes and retakes if you want to make it perfect. So it won't be correct. I hope that will be okay. Next declaration is that I'll be using lots of pictures and videos in this, which I've taken off from the internet, which is only for the educational purpose only. So I hope that should be okay with everyone concerned. Okay. So the topic for today's class and your interest is mechanics of uh, cricket. Uh, at the first declaration, I don't either play cricket nor am I a fan of the game itself. So that puts me in a very interesting position in which I can look at it objectively from a uh, mechanics perspective directly, like an academician should. If you are very fascinated by something, or if you root for something, or if you believe in something, that sort of clouds your understanding of things around. Uh, okay, the first explanation which I have. And secondly, this has been made with an intent so that the school students like yourself uh, are able to understand many of the things that we talk about. So first of all, I think mechanics, the subject is not very new to all of you as a student, right? In class 9, 10, 11, 12, whichever branch you take, uh, as long as it has physics in it, I'm sure there is some part of mechanics. So is there anyone who is coming from a non-physics uh, like after 10, I will not take up physics. Okay, so after class 10, 11, 12, I'm sure they will be. And the game itself is what we'll be discussing. So we'll try to keep it short and uh, let's begin. So the things which I would be talking about are uh, the structure of the ball, the pitch, and the bat, and then the mechanics aspects of it. Uh, related to the structure itself. For example, I have taken three cases. One is the mechanics of the human body, or short we can call it biomechanics, with how spin balling takes place. This involves concepts from kinematics, which you may have learned in terms of displacement, velocity, and acceleration. If any of the keywords which I speak are not clear to you, you have to just raise your hand and I'll try to explain it. Is that okay with all the students? Yes. Any of the keywords, okay? You just have to raise your hand immediately and I'll stop it and then I'll explain that. Secondly, I'll be talking about the mechanics of solid, which is the two parts. One is the impact of the ball on the pitch and then the impact of the ball on the bat. Everyone has seen some form of cricket at least, so they know what I'm talking about. And the last part will be about fluid mechanics, which involves swing bowling and the concept of boundary layer. Now, before we move ahead, can any one of you tell me among the students, how do you differentiate between an ideal solid and an ideal fluid? So if you have this piece, which I, for example, don't know what it is. How would you say whether it's a solid or a fluid? What's the difference between a solid and a fluid? Solid has a shape. No, but like fluid inside this bottle has a shape. Okay. Shape of the package. Not close enough. Well, anyone else? Yes. Sir, we can check compressibility. But then, what will you do after that? 
Yes. So it's all it can flow, right? If I sort of throw this in the air, this will be flowing. So the difference between a solid and a fluid is that if you take a piece of solid and you apply shear force on it, everyone understand what a shear force is? It's across the surface. It will try to retain its shape. Okay, it will slightly deform, but it will try to retain its shape. But if you have a fluid, and you apply a shear force, it will collapse immediately. Okay? Any ideal fluid will immediately collapse if you apply a shear force on it. So that is how you can differentiate between a solid and a fluid. Perhaps now is not a good time and later on in your school etc. you might be able to learn about this more clearly from the mechanics of perspective. Yes, the compressibility may give you some idea, but that itself is not enough to dif distinguish between two. Uh, okay. So with this outline, I will now proceed to my first objective, which is about the structure of a ball, pitch and a bat. <coughs> so before that, I discussed this, uh, there was once a time when I visited a museum, I don't remember in where or which country, but it had a piece of rock as a uh, as an exhibit and people could touch it. The important part about was that, that that rock had been brought back from the moon. So it was written there that it is perhaps the only object in your lifetime that you will touch which is from the moon. Now in that spirit, my question is that how many of you have ever touched a cricket ball? A real cricket ball? Are you all sure? <laughs> this seems to be a substantially high number. But anyways, uh, if you all have already, I have one for you. So I'll pass it from this side and it has to be, perhaps I'll start from that side. And you have to notice a few things. You have to notice the stitches on this ball and perhaps try to hold it and sense how heavy it is. Okay. So I'll start from that side. By the time I'll continue discussing this, the only person who will not be looking at it is the one who has the ball at that time. So most of you should be looking at the presentation. Okay, so a cricket ball has a cork inside it. It is made from a particular kind of wood. Okay, then it has a yarn. Okay, so with lots of fibers across it. Then you have a leather coating over it. And finally, there are two levels of stitches. One of them you can see runs vertically, right? And the other one runs horizontally. So it is essentially the horizontal ones are joining the two halves of this ball. So I have a short clip, a silent video hopefully, which will show the manufacturing of it. You can just look at it so that you have an idea how it's made. Okay. which bought the cork. Okay, so this is the cork which has been formed by compressing. Then you cover it. Then you form the shape which is not spherical as I see it. To make it spherical, we spin yarn over it. There are these leather sheets which cover what you have just made. Depending on the white ball or the red ball, 
and this is assuming which happens. So the horizontal switch sewing always happens by hand. Okay, there is no machine to do this. So you can invent one if you take up a suitable branch and you can later on. Okay, the precision which is required can only be achieved by hand. The vertical one can be done with you. So this is how it's formed. And then finally, there is some polishing applied on it. And after all this is done, this is what you will have in your hand. Where is the ball right now? Let's move it past. Okay, good. We can keep this. Now, to be able to understand, so the one who has the ball right now, right, can you tell me what should be the diameter of it? This by roughly? Or anyone knows what's the diameter of the cricket ball? Is it a good is it a good general knowledge question? What should be the diameter? What's the diameter of a cricket ball? You have to speak out loudly. No. So you can start from five to ten. You'll we'll actually get to a correct answer, right? That's one way to go about it. But it's roughly around seven centimeters, slightly more than seven centimeters. Okay. Now every process that you have seen in this video and every part of it is according to a British standard. So the willow or which makes the cork has to come from a particular kind of a tree. The leather strap which is used has to come from another kind. The weaving of the yarn which you have seen, there is an exact number of how many yarn should be woven and under what pressure and tension, right? Every yarn has a tension, right? You can take a string and sort of push it and it will have a tension. So that gauge you have seen which was moving around, that was measuring the tension through which it has to be measured. And finally, overall, you have the other aspects of it in terms of swimming. The final weight of it is also around, what's the weight of a cricket ball? Pounds. Huh? Pounds. Okay. So every diameter, weight, and dimension has to be according to a given British standard, and that is what we make it. Okay, this cricket ball. Now I have explained, I have told you to sort of pass this ball around so that you can understand and feel it. It's not as heavy as one might imagine. At the same time, once it has momentum, it will carry a lot of uh, sort of uh, effect on the back of the batsman. So the scene is something that you should notice because it will play a role later on. So this is the discussion on the structure of a cricket ball. Is there anyone who has a doubt understanding this briefly? Okay. In the language of engineers, we call this material as a composite material. We call it a composite material because it is actually made up of different kinds of things. Okay. If it was, for example, just the cork, we won't call it a composite. But it's not. Okay. So that makes it very particular. And the discussion about this ball was important because cricket is the only sport which has these or one of the only sports which has swimming in it and which plays a big role later on. Okay, so now I will move to the next part which is the structure of the cricket pitch. Now, most of us see when there is a pretty match talk in which some commentators and those sort of people go and see the pitch and they say this should be better, that should be better. The bowling should be easy, batting should be hard, and so on. Have you seen those sort of discussions? Yes. And then they point out to whether it's a lot of moisture and uh, there's a lot of grass and this and that. So, for your information, I mean, there is not a lot of science behind what they say. Okay. What they say is mostly anecdotal, means they have seen it by experience that happens, but it's not that they go and study exactly and then predict. So it's not a very scientifically spoken fact which they say. On this note, let us try to understand how a cricket pitch is made. So at the start, you have a trench which is formed. Okay. So you sort of remove lots of uh, sand and then you start off with a compacted bed and then you have a gravel which is 6 inch thick then you have a loamy soil which is 6 inch thick and finally you have the uh, top layer with the grass so first question anyone understands the meaning of the word compacted 
Anyone who understands the meaning of the compacted bed, compacted soil? No one? You are? Sir, like particles are very close. Yes. Just compress is not compacted, but particles are close. So you may have not seen a cricket pitch being made, but all of you have at least seen, seen a roti being made in the kitchen. Okay? So what you do is you sort of press it in a way that eventually certain amount of moisture leaves the roti, otherwise you can't make it. So that process is called compaction. And many times in compaction of soils and cement and many other uh, civil engineering structures, compaction is needed so that the porous, everyone understands the meaning of the word porosity or porous? Yes. Okay, pores are the parts where the fluid is filled inside the soil. So once you compact it, the fluid will be released and the pores will be closed. So if it becomes as less porous as it can be. So that is the meaning and automatically you can imagine that the density will increase a lot for any compact so we get to become more dense. Okay. So for example, when you ever go to hill stations, I mean all the way up at least above Manali, etc., you might do this snow fight with your family members. Okay. You pick up snow and so you will create a ball and then you throw it down. Now if you really want to hurt someone, you should compact it high enough and then it will just become like a stone. Then it will not be good for the then it will not be fun anymore. So it's fun only when you remove some amount of the soil uh, water from it, not all of it. So that is also that is the also compaction. So all these compacted gravels and the soil etc. are needed. Obviously, the lower parts of it are more hard, and as you go up, it becomes more soft. Like gravel is much harder compared to a soil and a dome and so on. And finally, you have the top there. Now there are these. Uh, 125 micron thick plastic sheets on the two extreme ends. Okay, can you see that? Yes, sir. Two extreme ends. The reason for putting that plastic sheet is so that there is no moisture from this part of the soil which should go into this. Okay, so this part of the soil should not be allowing the moisture to go on the other side. So that is why you put two plastic sheets. That is how you are able to preserve your pitch. Okay. So there is no transport happening and micro everyone understands this word 10 to the power of minus 6 okay so it's quite thin as you can see and then you have a field over so this is a example of how a cricket pitch is formed this is not according to a standard in the sense every country and every pitch curator can make according to their own for example they can vary the amount of soil that type of soil, the slight thickness, etc. So there is no standard and most of the time the home team tries to get some advantage out of it. Okay. So that is how the pitches are mostly curated. Roughly there are three kinds of pitches which uh, we have seen, which we see mostly. So the first of them is called the green pitch. It has obviously it's green because there is a lot of green cover on the pitch. Uh, now by green I does not mean it looks like a lawn, it, it will still look brown to you but it will have lots of tiny shoots of uh, grass, okay. So it will have moisture and that should be, give an indication because there are lots of shoots inside this, okay. If it, it has no moisture it will not be there, okay. Then this type of pitch is mostly found in England and Australia because of their weather and there you see the fast bowlers are actually quite, the ball swings a lot because of that. Uh, reasons you see how swinging happens, and that is why seam bowling in England and Australia is much more advanced than what we have here. So, this type of pitch is the suitable for fast bowlers. Secondly, or let's look at the most extreme case, which is a dead pitch or the dusty pitch. They are mostly what we have in our subcontinent India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and so on. And you see, we are somewhat uh, more better in spinning uh, the ball, at least traditionally have been, because of this reason, because of the bounce, etc., which this type of place offers. Now, these are just indicators. You can have any extreme of it, but roughly it is very difficult to make a green pitch in this part of the country and somewhat difficult to make this pitch on the other part of the country. So, it does depend where you are going to uh, play your game. Okay. So this ends our discussion on the structure of the pitch.
Okay. As I have said, unlike a ball, it does not have a standard. So anyone can make it in any particular way. And it will have a role when we study the impact. Now finally we move to the structure of the bat. Now there are two types of bats which we have been using. Uh, at least when the kids are small and then you want to buy a cheap bat, there is something called a unibody bat. Which means that the entire bat is made up of one piece of log of wood. Okay, so we'll see how it's made, and these are easily made in India. Even the ball which you have is made in a factory and made it. Okay, according to the international standards. So you first see the video of the unibody bat. Grind off the surface and make it a smooth. So then you have the rubber grip so that you can keep hold it easily. Now, one of the problems with this bag, can anyone tell me? Has, has anyone used this bag earlier on? Yes. What is, how did it break? From the middle from of the part. Yes. Mostly from the handle. Yes. So, it normally breaks at the intersection of the handle and the body of the bag. This kind of a unique body bag. The reason for that is that there is a sudden decrease in the area. Okay. So, there is a sudden Big and then you have a small. So this causes some sort of a phenomena called the stress concentration, where it is becomes much more easier to break uh, that. Now this stress concentration is not something very hard for you to understand. Every time you have to tear a piece of paper into two, do you start off randomly or you sort of fold it and then slightly create a cut and then it's very easy for you to tear. Can everyone recognize that? Okay. So sort of you fold it, create a crease, then you uh, make a small cut and then you know that it will always create two. The reason this happens is once you fold it, first of all you tell where the crack should be growing. Okay, You are dictating its path right away and then this small cut which you make allows this to grow around this direction. Okay, So there is this concentration sort of a thing happening. And that is the reason most of the time it would break from that part and hence it's not used. Uh, most of the time, if you get more advanced in your course, you should be able to understand this figure uh, over here. So if you are holding this back and the ball hits over here and then the ball hits over there. So there is something called the moment which is R cross F. Everyone understands this? R is a vector and the force is the direction. So if the force is the same in the two cases, R cross F will be larger if the ball is further down. And this is the point about which you would measure the R cross F. Okay. So this point automatically has a very large bending stresses as we would learn later on perhaps in your life. Now, what we usually use is a cane handle bat in which the handle is separated from the bat and it is joined using a adhesive. So we'll try to see. This. Oh, I'm sorry. I couldn't see the hand. Let, let's finish this and we'll come back to the question. No, 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 no question. What's your Body. Ball away. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. You can see that the handle is made separately and then it's joined from the back and then this then the strength will depend on the strength of the adhesive okay which we are using to join the handle and the back Thank you. 
Now in more advanced bats, you have in the cane, the cane is itself not just a piece of log like this, it is actually cut out like this and layers of rubber are put in between them and then it is compressed back. What it helps is when the ball hits the bat, these rubber coatings will help absorb that vibration or that shock. Okay, so the batsman doesn't feel a jerk. Now we had a question somewhere. Yes. So, so our tackle bat comes from Mangu's bat, which which has which has handled rubber mangu's bat. Yes. Another bat center. Another mangu's bat is very different. Why mangu's bat is very different? First of all, does everyone in the room know what is a mangu's bat? What is it? Can you tell me? I didn't ask whether you heard the name, I asked whether you know what it is. So this question is, the mongoose bat is very destructive, right? And why is that? It is known for maybe Yes. So this explanation can be given by a term called the inertia of uh, matrix. Have you heard of the moment inertia, mass inertia? Yes, sir. Okay. So that can be used to explain that. So that has a much better and when you conserve the angular momentum, that I term comes into that expression, I omega. So that changes from weight back to back. So for one particular bat, the I will be different and this particular bat will have a different I. So that is the, so mass distribution will change and that changes the I value and that causes it for high uh, sort of scoring. Okay. We will first of all learn how what is the impact of ball on the pitch and then perhaps you can re-ask me this question. Okay. We have not yet, I mean the ball has not been thrown yet. Okay. So it's still the start of the game. Okay. So but I will come back to the question. If I move ahead without answering your question, raise your hand again. Okay. So this is how the structure of the bat, the pitch and the ball is there. I hope you have got some idea about it, many of you perhaps knew. Now can I have the ball back because now it will be needed. Has everyone seen this? Okay, thank you. Now everyone understands spin balling, everyone has seen, seen a spin ball being balled. You may have not balled it ever but you may have at least seen it. And uh, from the perspective of uh, mechanics, it is studied uh, using kinematics in the sense you measure the velocities and accelerations in different parts. So let's first see, there are two kinds of spin balling. One is the wrist spin and the other is the finger spin. Okay. Most people don't know about it, so don't worry if you didn't know about it. There are two kinds of spin balling. One is the wrist spin. Everyone at least understands what a wrist is. And then you have fingers. So there are two kinds of balling. And the difference between them depends on which of your fingers leaves the ball at the last. So I'll demonstrate and you have this diagram on the right also. Uh, let's see. First of all, you can look up at your hand. Okay. So this is your uh, left hand, okay, and okay. So this is the first phalange, second, third, fourth, and fifth. Okay. So your thumb is the first one, second, third, fourth, and depending on which one you are there. So it's either a carpal or a metacarpal or a proximal phalange, intermediate phalange or the distal phalange, depending on which. So everyone can see this color coding and understand this. If you have a doubt about this diagram. It's better to check with your hand right now. Maybe you can look at your hand and see whether you can identify at least a few parts of it. Okay? Please see. You should be able to see all of them. I'll just wait for a few seconds so that you can understand it. And there is a constraint on all of us, how much each of these parts can move and rotate and so on. Okay. So in case of a finger spin, as the name suggests, the spinning of the ball happens through the fingers. Okay. So when I leave the ball, or when the baller leaves the ball, 
this second phalange is the last finger to be intact. Okay, when I leave this call, this is the last part which will actually be attached. I may hold it in any way. Okay, but once I release this, it will be the second phalange which will be the last finger to press. Similarly, for the fifth one, okay, fifth one is essentially this last one. Okay, and last one will also be leaving if I use my wrist and throw it. All these will not be in contact, and the last finger will be my this one. Okay. So that's the difference between the wrist spin and the finger spin balls. Now, ballers are of a different kind, and if you have a favorite one anywhere in the world, uh, you can find out which kind of spin ball do they practice. Normally, they have a kind to follow. Now, how are the measurements made? First thing, you want to really be sure that when the spin ball releases the ball. What is the rotation speed of the ball? Okay, that gives you a measure how much the ball might turn. Everyone can agree to that. Yes. If by releasing the rotation itself is less, then it will not uh, spin a lot, and if it is a lot, then it will have the potential to spin a lot. Okay, so that measurement is made using these sensors which are placed on the ball. So it's not done in a real game. You have to have a laboratory to do it. Okay, so these are reflective sensors. Okay, and there are around some 15-16 camera setup which measures the position of all of these sensors as the ball is in flight. And as the ball is in flight, each one of these points will change its position, velocity, and acceleration, and you will be able to measure how much, how fast the ball is spinning. Okay. Second, people want to study. What is the maximum capacity of a spinner? I mean, how much can a human being spin? So, for example, uh, as I said, I don't follow a lot of cricket, but say someone like Shane Warne or Murli Dhawan has a much greater capacity to spin ball compared to possibly me and many of us over here. How do you quantify that? How much more they can spin? That just depends on how much movement your fingers. And your wrist allows that again is done using measurements of sensors. Can you see things, some things which are kept on this hand? Okay, these are sensors attached to the hand, and similarly, this is the sensor attached to the fingers. Okay, remember, I have told you finger spin. What is the sensor? Second column. So this is the second column, the very last one. Okay. So these sensors will help us identify which joint moves how much for a baller. So normally when the studies are done, a baller is supposed to ball a few balls and then they can take out the interest and so on. So that is how the spin balling comes up. Now look at the third diagram, which is the balling action, and I'll briefly explain what this is. Uh, can I have? A you look can you please come? I need a demo desk. So can you just stand up? Have you ever thrown a bit at all? That's fine, we don't have to throw it anyways. So you just have to act as if it were for you. Okay. So now you have to imagine two lines which pass through it. I'll just hold you like this. Okay, so can you just stand? And now the batsman is over there. Okay. Can you just do it uh, do one mock action for me? Yes. Okay, fine. You don't have to go now, you just have to wait. Now you stand here. Now you have to look at two lines. If there is a line which is passing through his pelvis and going across, can you imagine that one line? Okay. Now there is another line which is passing through his shoulders like this. Right, okay. So right now these two lines are parallel. Everyone agrees to that? Yes. Okay. Now when you throw, this becomes like this. So the angle between the two lines is no longer zero degree now. Okay, for example, this part is more twisted now, and that happens now. You can go, thank you. That happens every time you throw a ball, that happens every time you hit with a bat. Okay, so for example, if I'm a batsman, okay, right now the line goes like this, this line goes like this. When I want to hit it, I'll rotate myself. Okay, and this remains straight, but this has changed its orientation. And then the larger I can rotate, the greater perhaps is the big shot I can play. Everyone agrees to that? Yes. Same will happen when you want to throw a ball in fielding. Okay, if you want to throw, you have to really rotate a lot. 
So this is called the x factor in cricket. It is called x because these lines are not parallel. Okay. So the larger is the angle between these two axes, the larger is your capacity to spin the ball, hit the ball, throw a fielded ball. Okay. Now these are the diagrams which somewhat explain this. Okay. So you have, for example, if you have a side on position and the batsman bowling direction is this one, and your foot and the shoulder, etc. So this is the heel of your foot. So okay, and you have the toe. Finally, you have the right shoulder and the left shoulder. So diagrams like this help us understand how much the shoulder and the heel, etc., are moving with respect to the other with each baller, and that explains their ability or the maximum ability to spin the ball okay so these are the kind of studies which are done and the measurements of this are made using the sensors which we have just seen so that is the spin bowling part of it okay let's now move to the impact of the ball on the pitch so we have seen an example before in which you had the uh, pitch the construction of the pitch and the ball so there are two possibilities one is that the ball is rigid. Everyone understand what a rigid solid is? Yes. Rigid solid is, it, it will not deform. Okay. Similarly, a soil or a pitch, if you call it rigid, it means it will not deform. In reality, most of the things in the world are deformable. It may be less deformable, but it will always mostly be deformable. So, in reality, okay, both the ball and the pitch are deformable. Okay. And there are easy ways to confirm this also, but clearly it is. But compared to the ball and the soil, which one do we think is more deformable? Soil. Okay. So in this illustration, we will assume that the ball is rigid and the soil or the pitch is deformable. Okay. Now it can deform in some ways. One of them is this symmetric sort of a deformation in which the deformed surface looks like this. Can you see there is a symmetry about this vertical axis? Yes. Okay. Then the other is that there is some sort of a crater which is formed and there is a hill on the other side. Okay. In reality, is it understood that this is more common than this one? Okay. This and one of the intuitive reasons can be this is more likely to form if the ball forms vertically. Okay. If it's fall, if it's falling in an, at an angle, then there is more likelihood of this. Okay. Now, where does the mechanics come in this? Well, it comes because of this impact and the contact forces. So let's try to see in this one. This is the ball which has somewhat penetrated the soil. Okay. And you can measure using high speed cameras how much this has gone down uh, from its base position, how much the soil has compressed, and the hill which has formed over there. Okay. This hill which is formed over here, is over here. Now the contact forces act in few ways. One is this normal contact, which is happening from this part of the ground, and then there is an inclined plane, which is a gift of force on this part. So everyone understands normal force and friction force? Yes. Sir. Okay, you know that once you measure the normal force somehow, the friction force can be measured as mu times multiplied by this if it is acting at its maximum value or if it is slipping. You knew this right, it's not always mu n. So this is the condition in which it is assumed that the friction is acting at its maximum possible value. That gives you the right to multiply it by mu. Okay? And then thereafter you can do calculations and see this. Okay? There are ways to measure this. Everyone has heard the word coefficient of restitution. Yes. yes. It is basically the change in the velocity which happens after say an impact of a ball on the ground. Everyone has heard of this. Okay. A similar concept can be applied over here to measure what is the this hill doing. So sometimes this hill actually grips the ball for a few seconds, and then there is a rotation about this then the ball proceeds. So that changes also. Can you see sometimes the batsman is surprised by what has happened to a ball. Okay. That is the time when they were not able to predict how the pitch will impact the speed of the ball or how much it bounces and so on. It's not that they have played any less cricket than us. Okay. It's just that it surprises. So these are the things which causes those surprises to happen. Okay. 
So this is where the mechanics of contact happens. Secondly, then there is a impact of the ball with the bat. I think there was a question for the in the pitch. Yes. So you had he had asked that when the rain when the rains fall, what should happen then? So any guesses from the crowd? What should happen in this? And he is just looking for some direction. What should? How should this be treated? Sir, deform. Deform or what? Shadow. Shadow. Okay. Once this happens, perhaps it will change this particular geometry. This particular geometry, and that might change the contact forces. So this is the mechanics answer. So what happens when rain is happening? We don't know exactly, but how much rain? That is also a question. Okay, but there is no clear cut idea about this. So, so will will moisture be will moisture will moisture be coefficient of friction? Coefficient of friction? Uh, do you? So he is asking whether the moisture will decrease the coefficient of friction in the pitch. So friction always happens between two surfaces. Ball and this, so ball is also wet right now. So then you will have to see it separately. You can't say because friction coefficient is always dependent on two surfaces. So you have to do that study separately. Okay. Unfortunately, there are no simple answers, right? He has a lecture like a girl, but world class lecture one guy. So that can't happen, unfortunately. So that is how we study this. Okay. Let's look at the impact of the ball on the bat. So what I described to you over here is an experiment. Everyone has done the pendulum experiment in their school. Yes. yes. Uh, time root pi root l by g, or you know it better than me. What's that? Root pi. Okay. So the length, and then you have the time period, and then you can measure how many um, oscillations have been done. Okay. And uh, that's how you measure the property. So you have a similar sort of a pendulum over here. Okay, this is a pendulum which hangs the bat. Okay, so imagine there's a big rod, and then there's a bat hanging from it. Everyone can imagine that. Yes. Okay. Obviously, if I now bring the ball back, the bat back, it will swing for a few minutes. And to allow its free rotation, you have put a ball bearing inside this. Everyone has seen a ball bearing. Yes. Okay. Your cycles. There are lots of uh, balls, okay. So that is a ball bearing, and this is used to reduce friction, so that you can have an unconstrained uh, rotation. Now, the experiment here was: Can you see these little dots inside this bat? Okay. So what they have done is they have taken a ball gun and hit the bat exactly at this point, then the next point, then the next point, then the next point. Okay. Then they have repeated hitting here, 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 and so on. So each of these points is the places where a ball has been hit, and then they have measured how much the ball has bounced back with what velocity. That is a measurement of the coefficient of restitution. So this was an experiment which was done to find the so-called sweet spots. Have you seen the commentators say that? We बल्ले के बीच से ball लगी है, बीच में hit हुआ है, इसलिए इतना लंबा shot किया है। So that is called the sweet spot of a cricket bat. Of course, that is all anecdotal, but there are experiments which have been done which do show that if you hit the bat with the ball in the center, and unfortunately, it is not the bat baller's intention to allow you to do this, right? So which baller would want you to hit for a six? So it is the batsman which would which has to time it in a way that they hit it. So the middle part which you can see is more dark. Can you see? Okay. So that is normally called the sweet spot in both the longitudinal and the transverse directions, and the rebound speed is largest in that one. So there is a measure called the coefficient of restitution which you have uh, learned. A similar sort of a measure is used to measure the impact of the uh, ball on the bat. Now this experiment is not a real life experiment, right? I mean, in reality, when you look at what, uh, how would this be different? First of all, the bat will not be standing still like this, right? There will mostly be a batsman which will give a particular sort of a rotation to the bat. So this experiment doesn't mimic that far. So it's just one step to understand 
how the impact of the bat and the ball are related. Okay. Now the last part is the swing bowling. Now in the start of the talk, I had mentioned that uh, these stitches in the ball are somewhat unique to this game of cricket. Uh, I have another ball over there. Can any one of you identify which ball is this? Hockey. Okay. So this doesn't have a stitch and most of the other balls which we use in the sports like a squash, tennis, none of them have a stitch like this. Okay. So cricket has this unique feature about stitching of this ball. So first of all, let's uh, understand some part of it. Okay. First of all, let's look at a baller and uh, understand what a swing bowling is. Perhaps you have known. I have taken a very extreme case. Okay, not every ball swings like this. Okay, we can watch it once more. Okay, so this is how a swing bowling looks like. Now, unfortunately, no swing bowler can guarantee swing every time. Okay. You might ask any swing bowler, they will not be able to, it's not under their control, unlike the spin. Spin is something that they have a greater control over. But un unfortunately, swing doesn't work in that way. So, one of the easier explanations is that you see the bowlers doing something like this throughout the game. Okay? What they do is, one side of the ball they want to keep smooth and the other will become rough as the game progresses. Okay, so they want to keep one side as smooth, the other as rough. And once that happens, something like this happens. In which say you have the rough side and then you have a smooth side, shiny side. Okay. Now the flow of the air and what is the movement of the ball while it is spinning? It's something like this. Okay. Can you see the units? This corresponds to stages like this over here. Okay. Now, when the air flow is happening, the air around on the pitch, then this is called a laminar flow. You may have not heard of this word, but it's just corresponding to a smooth fluid flow, flow around a uh, soft, uh, shiny surface. Okay. On the other hand, you have the rough surface on this side, so there is turbulent flow on this side. In the sense, the motion of the streamline, the motion of the air around is chaotic. It's not very smooth like this one. So this causes a difference of the force on the two sides, and then one of the sides switches away. I'll ask you which side very soon. Any idea, by the way? The shine is a should it swing on this side or should it swing on this side? Right, right. Shiny, part. shiny part. Okay, so if it leaves the turbulent part later on, then it will. Okay, if it leaves this uh, part, the same lines will leave early from the shiny side and late from this side, and because it is late on this side, it will put a force on the other side. Now, this should be okay to explain every swing bowling, right? Because that happens. But have you ever wondered why the first overs of a cricket innings are always given to a fast bowler? Because then the ball is shining on both the sides. Why is that happening? And if you look at this picture carefully, can you tell which ball of the game this is? No, no. Shikha and then 0 slash 4 bracket 0 0.1. Okay, so if it's this is the first over itself, and we have seen the amount of swing which happens, but this diagram should not be able to explain it because you will it is very unlikely in the first few balls you will have a rough and a soft side. So, anyone knows why this is swinging then? Uh, it can second in of the No, but in the ball, does you want that? Yeah. Yes. So, but that doesn't explain. Uh, I think you are somewhat right, but it's not exactly. Right. So the way uh, this baller has released the ball is not vertical. What she and rest of the other ballers in the earlier part of the game do is 
they release the ball in this position. Okay, it's not inclined like this. That is called a conventional swing, and this is called a contrast swing. Contrast because there is a contrast between the two sides of the ball, and conventional swing is this. So what happens? If this is the air which is coming in, or the air is constant and the ball is following it, if the seal is somewhat like this, okay, then you have turbulent flow on this side because when the air comes in contact with the stitches, it stops becoming a smooth surface there itself. So there is turbulence which happens because of the seal, okay, because of the inclination of this seal, and that is why. You have again a turbulent part on one side and laminar part on the other side, and then you have this sort of a thing. So the first few overs by a fast bowler are not thrown like this. The later parts of the game, maybe yes. Now one of the trivia or sort of uh, things which had taken the cricketing world by surprise was this fast bowler called Lapsit Malinga. Have you ever seen him bowl? Okay. Yes, so the way he used to bowl was the inclination was so high that it was almost vertical. So the ball was sort of coming in like this. So it, he had the ability to swing the ball at any part of the game. Okay, and that is where uh, this had taken the world by surprise at that time. So this is the discussion on the fluid mechanics part of it with this swimmer. So in reality, when we do these experiments, what we take is we take a wind tunnel. Wind tunnel is essentially just a enclosed space, and you have a fan on this side which will blow the air, and you can control what speed the air blows depending on how fast the fan moves. So you place the ball inside it, and then you have to now visualize the streamlines. Can anyone tell me how can you visualize the streamline of a flow of a gas? Everyone has seen Agarbatti. Yes. Okay, if you blow it, you can see the sort of how it flows, right? So that is called the visualization of a uh, streamline. So you can blow some sort of a flame or smoke like that, and those smoke will tell you how this is flowing, whether it's laminar or turbulent and what way and so on. Then there are measurements which can be uh, made. Okay. So that is where I thank you for your attendance in this talk. I think I was somewhere around 45 to 50 minutes. So I'll end that and if there's anything else to talk to me later, you can do it. Thank you. Okay. The floor was open for question, but I'll reopen it again. Any questions which I'll try to answer to the best of my ability. First of all, there is very little academic research in the subject, unfortunately. We as a country are busy making a lot of money in IPL and BCCI and all that. Okay. So unfortunately that's the reality. The uh, countries which actually invest in uh, research in mechanics of cricket are actually England and Australia. More, we hardly do that, unfortunately. I hope these things. But yes, questions from I think none of you are asking questions. Yes. Sir, sir, what if the both sides of the ball goes up? It should not, because if both sides of the ball go up, then you will have both sides that are not there. So the intent of any ball inside is to keep one side rough and one side smooth. Okay. River swimming, it was a big deal when it came back in the 90s with the Pakistan sites and all, okay? But nowadays, it's, everyone can just about do it. So there is a different mechanism for river swing for this. I have explained two of them. River swing is the third category. So I had a short time to discuss some of these things. Yes? Any further, any other questions? So are these two separate schools or two separate batches? So does the swing of the ball depend on its speed? Yes, because that will control how this turbulent and laminar flow are there on both sides. Okay, yes, there will be a difference. Yes. So by particles are so can you use that happens because of the moving action of uh, them. So compared to a spring, uh, spring baller, a fast baller, if you have seen, they take a big run up. Everyone has seen that? So if this is the small mass of the ball and my weight is capital M, our combined weight is M capital M plus small m. Okay. Now I try to take a big run up and I build up a good amount of velocity, let's say capital V. 
the velocity of both the small ball and myself is capital V. As I release the ball and stop, this entire momentum is transferred to one ball. So the ball is clearly going at a much larger speed than I was running. Okay? Because capital M plus small m multiplied by capital V is small m multiplied by the final at which it releases. Okay, so it is just a simple case of playing in momentum. Now the muscles which are used in this run up and throwing are much more sort of damaging to the tissues and muscles. That's why you have this. Okay, so fast bowlers normally have a lot of muscle tear because of this. The traction itself is that it causes some sort of an issue. Okay. Actually, there was a topic in which I wanted to discuss the muscles in fast bowling, but since the time was less, I couldn't do that. Yes. Yes, you are the uh, How does the hand orientation differ in off spin and leg spin? See, I am not a cricket coach per se. I'm not a cricket coach, so I think you can. <laughs> if you are asking me questions, unless you want to implement it tomorrow, please, sir, you can. Uh, Okay. So, any other question? I don't know, frankly. Yeah. You are trying to test my knowledge in cricket after declaring that this is out. <laughs> I think one of the easier ways is that uh, you can always open a smartphone and go to Wikipedia and check about what is it. If you have a doubt in understanding the mechanics of what is happening, perhaps I can help you how to proceed with that. If you are trying to test my cricket trivia, I may not be the right person for this. Okay? So, you have to do the pads, you have to do the body test, 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 you have to do the any further questions, please do feel free to ask and answer, answer the curve shape of that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I. How to, uh, I is the term I is the term that changes the mass distribution. So how much the curve is there in the bat that is decided by the batsman itself. For example, many of the batsmen actually don't go to a shop and buy bats like we do. They tailor made, they have their bats tailor made for them, depends on how much force and they can apply and what is their kind of a game, which order do they bat on and so on. But it has to still follow within a given standard of the game. Okay, so that is how they decide. And uh, I is the term that mass inertia is the term which changes depending on how, yes, I is the term. Perhaps in your class 11, 12, I don't know, at some point you should learn that. Hello. It is not proportional to anything, it just tells you how the mass is distributed in space. So it's actually a product of the mass of that small quantity and where it is located with respect to your measuring line. So it's, not, it's not a direct formula. Like for example, for a spherical ball, it is 2 by 5 mr square, okay, or some measure like that. But that is only valid if the ball is a so whole ball in itself, it's not a composite like a cricket ball. For cricket ball, you will have to recalculate it in a more complicated way. Yes, any further questions? I think if not, 
Thank you so much, Professor Gaurav, for that wonderful, insightful, and enriching session for all students and teachers. I would like to give you a round of applause.